Coming Home by Brennan Stoll. Brainerd Police announced today that arson was to blame for last Friday's early morning fire at the Allstate Building, located 317 Washington Street. Police Chief Walter Badeau told reporters that while details will be kept under wraps until investigators deliver their report early next week, the fire is being considered suspicious. Firefighters credit Friday's freak snowstorm with helping to contain the blaze. 10.15 and it's a little nippy here tonight in Garrison, with the mercury hovering around minus 10. If you're one of those diehard types out there fishing on Garrison Bay, remember to bundle up. I turned off the radio, my dad's old Farnsworth. The small red Bakelite unit had been on the sill above the kitchen sink since I was a kid. Washing the last few suds down the drain, it suddenly occurred to me how stupid it was to have something electrical so close to the water, and I wondered if it occurred to my father at all. If it had, I thought, he'd probably left it there out of sheer bloody-mindedness. He was like that. The Friday before, when a blizzard had buried most of Crow Wing County in snow, the intractable son of a bitch had insisted on shoveling his own driveway instead of hiring someone. Ida Thorson, an iron-haired woman in her 50s who runs the Holiday Station store on Highway 180, found Dad the next morning, face down and frozen solid. And so Buddy Kiefer finally lost the game of chicken he'd been playing with God for the better part of 73 years. When my half-sister Cheryl had called me in Oakland on Saturday to tell me about Dad's death, I don't think, okay, was the answer she expected. The quavering note in her voice firmed up fast, and in the tone angry fat women use when they're spoiling for a fight, she said, You're coming to the funeral, right? I'd last spoken to my father ten years before at Mom's funeral. He'd called me a liberal queer, and I told him he was a worthless bigot prick and that the wrong person was in the box at the front of the church. As far as parting shots go, it wasn't Oscar Wilde, but it was enough to drop my father's jaw, something I'd never seen done. It felt like a victory at the time, but afterward, it was hard to remember that drop jaw without also remembering the tears that had welled up in his eyes. I hadn't seen that before either. Those tears were the reason I traveled 2,000 miles to say goodbye and try to mend fences with the family. After three days with my half-sister, I decided there was a lot to say for broken fences. My three-year-old nephew Jason chose that moment to speed into the kitchen. From the living room, Cheryl whined. Jason Thomas Horner, get back here right now. When I walked to the doorway, I saw her standing, porcine and sweaty, next to the stairwell. She must have been trying to put him to bed. Seeing me, she put on her best, struggling, gold star mother face. Mike, he doesn't want to go to bed. Can you just scoop him up there? I'm worn right out. I bit my tongue before I could say that watching from the sofa as everyone else made funeral arrangements and kept house must have been exhausting. The satisfaction wasn't worth the fight, though. Yeah, I'll get him, I said, retreating into the kitchen where Jason was huddled in front of the island. I'd only met him three days before, but already I liked the kid. He had spirit. I think he liked me, too. I crouched down. Come on, big guy. It's bedtime. His brown eyes peeked out from under a shaggy mop of freshly washed blonde hair, and he said, Too cold, Uncle Mike. I couldn't argue with that. Freezing weather was a hell I'd almost managed to forget. I'm cold too, big guy, but there are lots of blankets around. Mommy will make sure you stay warm, and I'll check on you later too. Whether that made sense to him or not, I don't know, but after pursing his lips for a minute, he said, Okay, Uncle Mike. And extended his arms, which was good enough for me. My back protested as I picked him up, but the heaviness of his head on my shoulder produced a contentment that negated any discomfort. As I carried him to his mother, he whispered in my ear, Does the lake make you cold too? The question puzzled me, and after Cheryl put Jason to bed, I asked her about it. Oh, it's because of Dad? She said in a tone that suggested I just asked the world's stupidest question. He's been waking up at night talking about the lake. He knows Grandpa went to heaven at home, but he must have heard someone at daycare talking about the fishermen and gotten confused. Ice fishing was big business in Garrison, and every year at least half a dozen drunken sportsmen freeze to death on our lake, Mill Lock, after wandering away from their shacks in the dark. As far as Cheryl was concerned, the conversation was over and she turned her attention back towards the television. Soft California constitution or no, I decided I'd rather be outside in minus 15 weather than sitting here with her or staring at the walls of my room. Outside the streets were empty, and the crunch of snow underfoot was the only sound I could hear. In the silence, my mind picked over the events of the last week. Cheryl's phone call, the bumpy flight from Oakland, 
the waxy body at the funeral chapel that used to be my dad. I was so preoccupied that I didn't notice I'd arrived at the lake until I heard the creaking of the old boat launch. Maybe it was some kind of bone-deep need to dislike everything my family loved, but I'd never taken a millwalk. Jet skis are for assholes, and I was always just a little too chubby to comfortably take off my shirt in public. But alone, walking along its edge as the shifting moonlight lit the ice, making it look like cold fire, I felt an unexpected surge of affection for it. The lake's marina extends out from the shore in a half-mile wooden arc, and the air got colder and colder the further I walked out over the water. At the end of the marina is a plaza dotted with several poorly made sheds, each casting oblong shadows. As kids, we joked that they were built by drunks, but in the polar emptiness of that night, they weren't funny at all. In fact, just looking at them made me uncomfortable for reasons I couldn't explain. To my left, the steel gate leading down to the boat ramp was hanging open, its rusted bulk stirring slightly as I walked past. From where I was standing, I could see the three parallel docks the summer crowd used to tie up their boats. Now they were all gnarled through with ice, locked in place till the thaw came. The docks were the same length and perfectly straight, yet, from above, I could have sworn the two at the sides were bowing in slightly, drawing my eyes towards the center. An unease started to gnaw at me then, but even so I couldn't stop myself from walking further down the icy wooden ramp. Seen from below, the latticework of timbers supporting the marina took on the appearance of an enormous ribcage descending from its spine and I was sorry I'd looked. At this point, I'd like to say that I came to my senses and went back home to my room, but that's not what happened. By now, I felt as though I was a performer, following a script I'd never seen but somehow knew by heart. There was room for improvisation around the edges, but the thrust of the story had long since been decided. With the docks locked in ice, it looked like he could step right off the edge and walk forever into the frigid dark. I imagined my father in his Husqvarna jacket and red woolen cap putting down his fishing rod and walking away until the night swallowed him, just the way Jason said. I shook my head. Jason was three and genuinely believed a rabbit brought him presents every Easter. No one expected him to have his facts straight. Middle-aged men who travel thousands of miles to somewhere they're not wanted in order to show up a dead man were supposed to know better. But that unease which had started moments earlier, it blossomed into full-on nausea as a sound broke the silence. It started out like a great yawn, then deepened to a rumble. Its pitch increased, and I recognized it as a sound of cracking ice. The frozen crust surrounding the middle dock was starting to spiderweb, buckling rather than splintering, as if it was being pulled downwards into the lake. As the intensity of the noise increased, I felt the platform where I was standing begin to bend. And just as I thought I was about to be pitched headlong into the rapidly disintegrating surface, the center dock broke free and sank into the lake, followed by the ice around it. The odd sinkhole grew outwards, perfectly round and looking entirely too much like a frozen throat. It stopped only feet from me. Clouds covered the moon above, but even in the half-light I could see that the rim of the thing wasn't like ice or water. Instead it was smooth and warm to the touch, like newly blown glass. Carefully, I peered over the edge. The walls of the thing glistened, and I could see the shaft went down at least ten feet before disappearing into darkness. That didn't make any sense. The ice on any part of the lake couldn't be more than a foot and a half deep at most, but I wasn't given any time to think about it. As quickly as one noise had faded, another took its place. This noise was wet and pulsing, and despite every brain cell telling me it was wrong, an idiot curiosity took hold and I had to know what was making it. Overhead the clouds finished passing across the face of the moon and in its light I got my answer. A wet, roiling black mass swarming up towards me with a grotesque agility. I couldn't tell if it was one thing or many and I wasn't going to stay to find out. I ran. Reaching the boat ramp I heard the things crash onto the wharf where I'd been standing. It sounded like roadkill being dragged into a ditch burst entrails scraping on concrete. Almost insane with terror, I slipped on my way back up the ramp and heard them gain ground. The horrible slaughterhouse noise seemed only feet away as I regained my footing and scrambled up the boat ramp past the rusted gate. The unusual shadows of the tool shed seemed to reach for me across the plaza. No matter how hard I ran, the creatures gained and the hazy lights on the shore came no closer. My last thought before being overcome was of Jason. 
As the light faded and I was sucked into an icy, fibrous mass that quivered with awful vitality, I heard his voice whispering, Does the lake make you cold too? Two fishermen found me unconscious and hypothermic in the center of Mill Lock, miles from both the shore and marina. The doctors at St. John's told me that aside from a coin-sized patch on the back of my neck, I'd escaped frostbite. They called it a medical miracle, and I didn't correct them. They also said that I must have become disoriented by the cold and walked away from the shore. I didn't correct them on that either. When I was well enough, I left the hospital and went straight home to Oakland, missing my father's funeral. The angry answering machine messages from Cheryl thinned out after a few weeks, and though I felt bad for leaving Jason, I couldn't go back to Garrison. The gap in my memory between being taken and being found is never filled, but when the temperature drops, I start to shake, and faintly I hear a wet, pulsing sound inaudible to everyone else. Winter is coming back around, and as the one-year anniversary of that night approaches, the frostbite scar on my neck has begun to tingle. It has to be a coincidence. It has to be. Coming Home was written and narrated by Brennan Storr. Hey, I know that guy. With additional voices from Ian Gibbs as newscaster and Sarah Kent as Cheryl and Jason. All music in these audio dramas was provided by Epidemic Sound, with the exception of the final song from Coming Home, which was There Are No Answers by Hexagram, which was used with permission. We'll be right back with our patron shoutouts and listener mail.